through working with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and also the Rockefeller Foundation, um, we've been working with smallholder farmers in Kenya and Nigeria to help get mangoes and cassava to markets where previously you had a ton of spoilage on the farm. So as you can imagine, if you don't have the trucks, the refrigeration, or even the roads in some cases to get your crop to market, you know, your food waste and your spoilage is just at a whole new level. Welcome to the Business for Good podcast, a show where we, Paul Shapiro and Tony Okamoto, spotlight companies making money by helping solve some of the world's most pressing problems. Hello, and welcome back to the Business for Good podcast. I hope you've been enjoying the show. I know I've been learning so much from our guests. As some of you know, Paul and I have spent our careers in the food and food sustainability spaces, and it's been really eye-opening and inspiring to hear ways people from different parts of the planet are using business to better the world from completely different angles. Last episode, we heard from Bharti Singla about her efforts to reduce air pollution in India, and this week we're thrilled to be chatting with Michelle Masick from Appeal Sciences about cutting down food waste. But before we get to the interview with Michelle, I just wanted to chat a little bit about this book I recently read. It's called Quirky by Melissa Schilling, who's an NYU Business School professor. And what she does is she essentially looks at some of the most successful innovators of all time and looks at what some of their most common traits are between them. And she, of course, describes them, as the title implies, as being, well, quirky. And so by innovators, she isn't talking about one-hit wonders who come up with something really cool one time, even if it makes them rich and famous. Rather, Schilling is talking about people who serially came up with amazing innovations or discoveries, especially in different fields. And so think about people like Einstein or Tesla or Steve Jobs, uh, Elon Musk. But One of the uh, most interesting people I learned about, I already knew about her, but I didn't know much about her life. And so let me just tell you, if I were to say to you, who was the first woman ever to win a Nobel Prize? Maybe some of you would know that it was Marie Curie. But what if I then said the second time a woman won the Nobel Prize, who was it? Well, If you guessed Marie Curie again, you would be right. In fact, she won a second Nobel Prize in a completely different field from the first one. And what if I said to you, the third time a woman won the Nobel Prize, who was it? Well, this time, if you said Marie Curie, you would not be right. But if you said Marie Curie's daughter, you would be right. It's pretty amazing. In fact, her family has five Nobel Prizes to its name already. Uh, It's just pretty stunning. And Curie, in fact as credited with saving uh, tens of thousands of lives during World War I with her invention of the mobile X-ray machine, which treated more than a million people from the French and other allied armies. So it's a pretty incredible story uh, about her, and I was riveted by it. But when you look at the traits that Schilling talks about for these um, innovators, there's lots of different traits that she writes about, and I'm not going to go into the whole book, but I do think it's worth noting that a couple of them are, well, one, that they liked working in isolation, that they had some social detachment from other people. In other words, their creativity often was sparked by working alone. Schilling has a very instructive section about the evidence against group brainstorming meetings. I mean, how many times have you been in a meeting in the office and people get together to brainstorm together? Well, Schilling presents a lot of evidence that that's actually a really ineffective thing to do for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, that it, you know, a lot of the times you have the free rider problem where people will just ride on to other people's ideas, or people may be too inhibited to share their own ideas, or a whole host of reasons why brainstorming in a group is a bad idea. Instead, uh, it seems better to ask people to brainstorm in isolation on their own, write down their ideas, and then bring people together in a group. I know that I personally love working by myself, and that doesn't mean I don't like working with other people, but I feel like I'm the most productive when I can sit in a quiet space and brainstorm for myself and then meet up with someone to share ideas. And so I have a business partner. We meet a couple times a week, and we bounce our ideas that we've come up with our own with each other. Yeah. And so that's a a really key part of the book and uh, something that was a real takeaway for me about these innovators. Um, Another was the ability to withstand pretty severe criticism. All of these folks have withstood very serious public criticism. 
I, I expose myself to criticism very, very greatly on social media. And I'm a person behind behind the computer screen. And I, I think that sometimes people don't realize that their negative online comments may be affecting someone on the other side of the computer screen. Tony's probably not going to mention this, this herself, but I look at the comments on her stuff and it's crazy. Uh, one person wrote on an Amazon book review for, to, for uh, one of Tony's cookbooks. They gave it a bad review because they claimed they didn't like the shade of lipstick that she is wearing in the author photo on the back of the book. <laughs> yeah, they, they were pretty harsh and uh, that's not that's not the only thing I've gotten bad reviews about my hands. They don't like my hands and I've gotten negative comments about my hair and my bites are too small or my bites are too dainty. And so it's just, it's just the criticism that business owners take, especially business owners who want to do good in the world. They are held to higher standards, I feel. Yeah. And in fact, we're going to be talking about that in an upcoming episode where we're talking with, um, well, I'll leave it a secret, but we're talking with a really cool entrepreneur who talks about that very that very phenomenon of the tallest tree in the woods is the one that gets cut down because uh, it's the tallest one. But the criticism that Tony has taken for her bite sizes or lipstick shades is nothing compared to the type of criticism that Schilling writes about the people in these in in the book. Uh, not only Franklin and and obviously Musk, but one of the more interesting stories about Marie Curie. The second time she won the Nobel Prize in 1911, as she was winning the prize, a public scandal broke out about her personal life. It was discovered that she was having an affair with a married man. Now, that's a big deal. But in 1911 in Europe, that's especially a big deal. And she was getting thrashed in the press. People were mocking her brutally. In fact, it was so bad that a violent mob assembled outside of her house and she couldn't even go home and had to go stay uh, stay somewhere else because she couldn't even get into her house with this mob there. And it was so bad that the Nobel Committee told her, look, we're not going to take away your prize, but we don't want you to come here to pick it up because we just don't want the controversy associated with you. And Marie Curie is such a badass that she said no, and she went to go pick up the prize anyway, even though they asked her not to. And then just a few years later, like I said earlier, her invention ended up sparing tens of thousands of lives and treating more than a million people on the battlefield. And so this ability to weather criticism is one of the key traits, or maybe just not to not to be as affected by criticism, maybe is what it is, is one of the key traits of these innovators. And it made me think about one serial winner who Schilling does not write about in the book, Rocky Balboa, when he says that in life, it's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. That is how winning is done. And if you want to discuss this book or anything else about business or making the world a better place, we're going to be hosting a monthly Google Hangout session for folks who support the show at $5 or more on Patreon. You can go over to businessforgoodpodcast.com to sign up. and We'd be so honored to have your support. Now on to our interview with Michelle. As a plant-based food blogger and a huge avocado fan, there's a meme that I love that shows a perfect, beautiful avocado at 1 p.m. And then at 1.01 p.m., that same avocado is already mushy and rotten. That, dear listeners, is what my nightmares are made of. Trust me, I can attest that Tony both loves avocados and hates wasting money. But letting produce rot isn't only wasting money, it is wasting food and all the resources it took to produce that food. Think about it. Up to 40% of what we grow gets thrown out. All that land, all that fertilizer, all those pesticides, and yes, pesticides are still used on organic produce, albeit organic pesticides. All those greenhouse gas emissions created by our agricultural system, all so that our food can be buried in a landfill. Well, One innovative startup says it has the solution to prevent a lot of food waste. Appeal Sciences, that's A-P-E-E-L, get it? Has developed a plant-based edible film that's applied to produce at the farm, which dramatically slows down the rate of produce spoilage. Appeal has made itself appealing to some big backers, raising over $40 million recently from a host of influential investors from Bill Gates to legendary Silicon Valley venture capital fund Andreessen Horowitz. 
Editorial note, after this interview was recorded, Appeal actually went on to raise another $70 million, totaling now $110 million for the startup. With us today on Business for Good is Michelle Massick, who serves as a director at the company. Welcome, Michelle. Hi, thanks for having me. All right, Michelle. So first off, just tell us what Appeal actually is. What are you putting on the produce and how does it make it last so much longer? So Appeal is a coating and it's made from plants. Uh, More specifically, it's made from lipids that are found in every bite of fruit that we already eat. And when this coating is applied to the surface of fresh produce, it doubles or triples its shelf life naturally without the use of refrigeration, controlled atmosphere, or harmful chemicals. And that's really good for kind of us and for the planet, but also for the farmers and suppliers and retailers who are responsible for growing our food and getting it to market as they're facing kind of tremendous loss due to the spoilage of produce. Cool. And so correct me if I'm wrong, Michelle, but uh, appeal it can double, or as you say, even maybe triple the shelf life of the produce. But as Tony was talking about earlier, sometimes with avocados, you have this very tiny little window of ripeness, right? Sometimes people talk about it being only a a two-day window, although it seems more like a two-hour window to me uh, (laughs) sometimes. But but I think it, uh, you guys assert that it can actually increase not only the shelf life, but also the window of ripeness, right? Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, ripe time, that's the big thing with the avocado. You know, you go to the store, you spend two, three, four dollars on avocados, and you have this limited time to enjoy them when they're green and perfect. And half the time you're getting home and you're cutting into it and you see those kind of brown lines inside it already. And it's just, it's such a kind of frustrating experience. One of the reasons why we wanted to focus on avocados first. But um, with our product, uh, we can get double the ripe time from an avocado simply by, again, just slowing down the rate that the avocado gets bad. So, right, what our product is doing is it's slowing down the water loss and the oxidation. By doing that, we're able to naturally extend that perfect green time for your avocado, which is exactly when you want to eat it. Uh, So, you know, when you think about the avocado and, you know, how often you have to kind of throw them away and how painful of an experience that is, uh, we think it could be a whole lot less painful. So you alluded to this, Michelle, about the issues with refrigeration and uh, also other chemicals like fungicides that get applied. But tell us what happens now to produce that gets picked and is is going to the store. And then what can change with the use of appeal from the time it's picked to the time it gets to the grocery store? Yeah, you know, we really built this system, this food supply chain over, you know, the previous decades that's meant to address the perishability that's inherent in every piece of produce and make it more transportable. And so there are all kinds of tricks we've employed from refrigeration uh, in the system to control the atmosphere to all types of different ripening processes that are all intended, again, to get the fruit from the farm to you before it spoils. And so what we're doing is we're essentially relaxing the amount of time with the fruit uh, by keeping it healthy longer. So you can also relax some of those supply chain systems that have been used previously and in, in, you know, in lieu for a natural solution like ours. So can you detect it in any way? I mean, can you see it or smell it or taste it? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So it's measured in the order of nanometers. You can't see it. You can't taste it. It's an incredibly small amount of material that's on the outside of the fruit. And again, it's, you know, if you were, for example, of scale, if you were to eat exclusively appeal fruits and vegetables every day, uh, you'd be getting something like a tenth of a calorie um, in extra fat. It's such a small amount of material. So completely imperceptible to the consumer. And what about cost? Does produce treated with the peel cost more or does reduced spoilage actually save money? No, and that's the great thing. Uh, Appeal really pays for itself for our supply chain partners. And so uh, the benefits are passed along to the end consumer, but uh, not any extra cost. So an avocado doesn't cost more today at Costco than it did before Appeal started getting applied to it? Nope, exactly right. So we're working with Delray Avocado to supply Appeal Avocados to Costco, and they've been able to keep the the price the same. Cool. And is this all Costco's? We're in the Midwest right now. I want to say around 100 stores. We're also in Harps Food Stores in the Midwest. They're um, a high-quality Midwest retailer. And that's where we're starting, but we are expanding quickly. So a lot of the times I'll go to the supermarket and I see produce and it's very evident that it's been sprayed with wax. Uh, Sometimes you even see a sign in the grocery store uh, disclosing that it was sprayed with wax. 
why is appeal different from that and how is it different from that? Yeah, that's a great question. So wax is is really interesting. Like most people don't know this, but the reason why uh, you see a lot of wax on fruit in the U.S. is because the U.S. consumer really likes shiny fruit. So grocers found out that if you waxed it, um, it actually helps with sales. So the wax is really about appearance more than anything else. A pill is is not a wax. So essentially, you know, what we're doing is we're creating the perfect microclimate inside the fruit that allows it the kind of the perfect exchange of water loss and oxidation, whereas wax actually kind of inhibits that process and doesn't have any impact on freshness. You're also doing work with small farmers in Africa. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the company was actually founded in 2012 uh, with a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And it was because they recognized early on that there would be a major application for this in countries that lacked access to refrigeration, like in sub-Saharan Africa, for example. And so uh, through working with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and also the Rockefeller Foundation, um, we've been working with smallholder farmers in Kenya and Nigeria to help get mangoes and cassava to markets uh, where previously you, you had a ton of spoilage on the farm. So as you can imagine, if you don't have the trucks, the refrigeration, or even the roads in some cases um, to get your crop to market, your, you know, your food waste and your spoilage is just at a whole new level uh, to what it is here. And so we've been working um, you know, with those folks to, to pilot different programs in sub-Saharan Africa. And we actually see kind of a long-term uh, potential there to help you know, not only kind of demonstrate the, the value of this technology, but to help smallholder farmers uh, gain more value for the crops they're already growing. That's cool, Michelle. So does one size fit all with a PO? In other words, does what you put on avocados work on apples, for example, or is that more like apples to oranges, pun definitely intended? We get a lot of puns around here, let me tell you. So so actually, no, we have a specific formula for each fruit and vegetable. And that's because if you think about it, an avocado skin has kind of different surface properties to that of an apple. But it's the same materials used. So it's really just about kind of fine tuning that combination for each fruit category. Uh, so if you're a, a fresh fruit supplier or retailer and you know you want to treat avocados, we're giving you a peel avocado treatment. A lot of produce is harvested long before it's ripe so that it doesn't go bad during transport. Could you see a peel allowing us to eat more produce that was picked when it was ripe? Well, that's exactly the vision for what we're doing um, with our product because you have more time from, you know, from farm to retail to your kitchen counter. Farmers can actually leave the fruit on the vine longer. Most people don't think about this, but, you know, the fruit that we receive today in many places is lacking nutrition. It might look really good. Like the tomato might look nice and red, but it's missing that, that optimum sugar content or lycopene content because it was picked green in order to get all the way to you in time. And so when you have more time in the supply chain, you can leave the fruit on the vine longer. And so that's actually one of the really exciting applications that we see. And um, you know, with what we're learning too about kind of how these nutrients relate to flavor, you, know, you can also expect to, over time, have better tasting fruits and vegetables in the store. I'm imagining that the produce industry probably has a lot of well-entrenched, long-established interests and that I'm, I'm just envisioning these like white lab-coated PhDs from a PO offering the solution to them to help them keep their produce longer, uh, keep their produce fresh longer. So is that essentially what's happening and have they, how have they received you all? Obviously, you're making some headway on avocados, but how has a PO been received by the produce industry? Yeah, you know, that's it's really interesting. It's something we thought about a lot in the beginning too, is just, you know, this industry has been doing kind of things in in a you know, a pretty consistent way uh, since the beginning of time. And, you know, how would a solution like ours be received? And we've been welcomed uh, with open arms. And I think again, it's because, you know, in terms of value propositions, we're helping to mitigate loss that's already happening in the supply chain. So that translates to hard dollar savings and revenue opportunities and the ability to export into new markets uh, at, for every member of the supply chain. And so they're really excited about it. Um, you know, it's, it's a very kind of long relationship building process, but, um, you know, we're excited about the partners we've kind of formed and um, the, the ability to not just bring these I guess you'd say kind of good for people and planet benefits um, into the food system, but 
uh, tremendous revenue opportunities for farmers, suppliers, and retailers who were losing a tremendous amount of value to food waste. So let me just ask you uh, this then about that. So I can imagine the processors would really love this and the retailers would love it. In terms of the growers themselves, uh, obviously, if there is less waste at the end user state, then it might mean that they would sell fewer pieces of produce if you need to grow fewer avocados to satisfy the avocado market. So is there a difference in the industry between how growers receive it and how processors are receiving it? Yeah, it's really interesting. And we've, we've heard kind of the, the idea that, well, is the, is the trash can the best friend um, for, for some of these, you know, producers? You know, we've found it from like a macroeconomics level that, you know, that to be suggested. But when you get down to the individual producer level, what, you're, what we're really offering and how we've been received is extremely well because what the individual producer is able to do is to bring a better piece of produce to market. And that allows differentiation and even kind of better deals with retailers. So, you know, we, we, we heard kind of the old adage about the trash can being a best friend. But our experience so far has been that individual producers are really excited about it because they get to bring a differentiated piece of produce to market where before my bananas might have been like your bananas might have been like your bananas. And now there's a, a new value standard for differentiation. Is it marketed to consumers as produce treated with appeal? For example, if someone's listening to this podcast and they want to go out to Costco, how can they find it? Does it say this has appeal? Yeah, so we we label. We want you to know where you can go and find appeal produce. So there's uh, there's an appeal mark. Um, it's our logo and our name, and that's carried on. So, for example, if we're doing bagged fruit, you'll be able to see that. Um, we're also doing prominent in-store signage, uh, so shoppers will be able to see where the appeal produce section is in the store. That all kind of ties back again to our website, where you can come and learn more about where we are in the country. You can drop in your zip code and find out stores near you, you that have appeal produce. I was also wondering what you're going to do next. So you started with avocados, which I am so grateful for because I love avocados and it breaks my heart every time I have to throw one in the compost bin. But what else will you be saving me from being totally distraught about? Well, the exciting thing is that we haven't found a fruit or vegetable that appeal doesn't work for. So uh, in terms of categories, um, we've been able to, again, from plants, uh, make a formula that doubles the shelf life of dozens of categories. So that's stone fruit, asparagus, citrus, micro citrus. Like there's some really exciting opportunities for the types of varieties of fruits and vegetables that have never even seen a store before because they have such a short shelf life. So in terms of what's next, uh, we definitely will be kind of uh, touting the appeal avocado horn for some time. But we're also, um, you know, stay tuned for some exciting developments in the citrus realm and then also in asparagus. I cannot wait for those, especially citrus. But let me ask you just going further beyond produce. So um, about a fifth of all of the meat that is produced in the country gets thrown out. And that, you know, it's bad enough for produce to get thrown out. But to think of animals who are being raised on factory farms and, and slaughtered just to be thrown into a landfill, it's it's really distressing to think about all of those lives lost for food waste. So could appeal theoretically be put on meat or do you have any aspirations to prevent food waste in the meat space also? So we don't have any current plants, but um, again, it is theoretically, uh, that could be an area of opportunity for us. Because if you think about it, anything that's suffering uh, due to water loss and oxidation, and that's most perishable products you can think of, would be a candidate for appeal at some point in the future. But we are all fruits and vegetables for the foreseeable. All right, Michelle, winding down here. Now's your chance to plug anything you'd like, important books or films you think people should check out or anything else you'd like to get some eyeballs on. Oh, yeah. Exciting. OK, well, I've really been eating, reading, breathing appeal recently. Um, so I'm not on my book game as best as I'd like to be. But I'm about to start The Food Explorer by Dan Stone. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but Dan's a uh, geoscience and environmental writer, and uh, the book follows uh, the story of David Fairchild, uh, and he was a late 19th century food explorer, and he was responsible for introducing crops like avocados, mangoes, and seedless grapes to the country, so I'm just starting to crack into that one. Um, and then in terms of podcasts, I'm, I'm pretty obsessed with How I Built This uh, by Guy Raz. It's an NPR show. 
just, again, it's, you know, episode after episode of great builders uh, that we're familiar with. If you're getting started, I think the Blake Mikowski episode, uh, founder of Tom's is really, really interesting. And it's um, a good one to, to catch. Cool. We are both listeners of that podcast also, and hopefully we will hear appeal on there sometime uh, when you guys are a a Silicon Valley unicorn, or I guess a Santa Barbara unicorn, I should say, since you're based in Santa Barbara. I have one more question. How did you get involved in business? How did I get involved in business? So I've been in the Silicon Valley landscape for the past 10 years, working at early stage startups, ranging from consumer internet companies to uh, visual web communities. Um, to different venture capital firms. And I had always really just had a passion for food and watching what was happening. And this really interesting convergence uh, between VC and food and technology had been happening, I'd say, in the past five years. And so I made a shift into that. And the, the rest is really history. But I've always kind of considered myself a builder and have been interested in working alongside founders and companies that are really trying to make impact on the way we live and on the way we eat. Cool. And finally, Michelle, one of the things we always offer guests at the end of our interviews is a chance to tell listeners anything for which you are grateful in your life. So now's your chance to give any shout outs to anyone or anything that you are grateful for. I'm grateful for so many people and so many things, but I I just kind of want to give a nod to how grateful I am personally and also professionally to nature and that all that it's affording us right now, I think, you know, when we look at the greatest challenges that are facing us as a society today, uh, and if we were to look closely at nature, we would find a sophisticated technological solution to it. I mean, think about it. Nature's been innovating for 14 billion years. So I'm grateful for it. And I hope that more of our innovators and entrepreneurs of our time are going to look to nature for inspiration because it holds the key. All right, folks. Well, there you have it. Science to the rescue alongside nature. Appeals using the power of plants to keep the plants you buy fresher longer. Seems like a miracle, but really it is just the power of a business that's created to help solve a serious problem, in in this case, food waste. So thanks again for joining us, Michelle. We're certainly rooting for your success. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle. All right, folks. Thanks so much for listening to the show. We hope you got a lot out of it and that you will show us some love. You can rate Business for Good as five stars on iTunes, support us on Patreon, and tell your friends interested in business or really just in making the world a better place about the show. And we'd love to hear what you're thinking. Please feel free to contact us anytime via our website, businessforgoodpodcast.com. And as always, we hope that you will be in the business of doing good. 